I feel like I should start this show by singing some World War I song or World War II song or something. Maybe Tramp, 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 The Boys Are Marching. I bet you don't even remember that one, oh, yes, Marie, do oh, you? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Marie, get out. We're in... We, I didn't realize that inside the town offices in your historical office in Shazy, there are beautiful cut the glass stained windows, glass. stained glass windows. From the Methodist Church. Really? This was the uh, original Methodist Church here in Shazy. Well, that's why it looks like a church when you drive by. And we want to keep them because it goes with the historian's office. Isn't this neat? You told me something before we even sat down here that I want to blow your horn about. Mm -hmm. You came, somebody came here and looked at your, at your office and they said, what? We were the best town historian's office in the state of New Don't York. Don't you love it? Yes. Who was that that said that? Uh, Mr. Jeff Huth from Albany. Just came up here for what reason? To uh, do a, a research on it because he belongs to the uh, Council of Historians of out of Albany. That makes you feel kind of nice. Yes, it does. That's great. How long have you been here, Marie? Five years. Wow. And we've done a, a lot of uh, sorting, and we're still sorting. We'll I'll sort the rest of my life. Oh, my goodness. When you're in this business, that's what you're in the business of doing. Right. That and finding genealogies for people, doing their genealogies or their family histories. That's amazing. Amazing. More people are getting into that now. We have histories here uh, back to the 1700s because of people have given us di old diaries and old Bibles, and we've compiled all this information. Well, the town goes back to the 1700s. Right. You, I have before me, what is this I'm looking at? It's a, 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 it's a dedication map we had when the town was like 300 years old. Not the charter. The charter is not until 1804, but the town was 300 years old, 1976. And they I made. I want to look at this map for just a minute. Let Calvin take a look at it as I hold the microphone behind me. It's kind of neat. Shows a little bit of what life was like around here in Shazy. And because uh, there is, we've met so many wonderful people, visited so many tremendous places around this area. And I think the rest of us in the North Country and those people who will be viewing this program called Our Little Corner, whenever it's aired, are not nearly familiar enough with the history of Shays E. So I would like to invite some of our viewers to come on up here and talk with Marie, stop over and talk to Fred at the Alice T. Minor Museum. One of the reasons I wanted to show this to start with, Marie, is because here... Uh, this was put out by the Town of Shazy Bicentennial Committee right. 23 years ago. Right. Now right. 300, 200. I've got 100 right. years. <laughs> I've been around for 100 years myself. It's about time for my centennial. But the, uh, it tells you all the historical things that happened here. From the very beginning, now we're going back. We're going, oh, well, sure. We're going back 465 million years ago for the Shazy historical highlights to talk about the town under the waters of the Shazy Sea. That's where it began. And over here in 1950, it says, displaced families from Europe, from a Europe ravaged by World War II, were settled in Shazy. Several remain today, adding much to our community. And guess what? Even 23 years after that, several more remain. Right. Tell me a little bit about that history and how that came about. How did those families get here and why? Well, one was uh, Mrs. Dr. and Mrs. Spear. Dr. and Josephine, Dr. Uh, Andrew and Josephine Spear. Jo our viewers know Josie Spear from the, from the latter days, as I say, for her, all of her work with senior citizens and the, and the oh, kitchen, kitchen, RSVP band. kitchen band. But they, many of our viewers do not know that she was so instrumental in this story. Was, Tell uh, me a little bit about she it. She was uh, instrumental in that she did a lot of the uh, paperwork to have, uh, which there is a lot of paperwork when, you, when they leave one country, come to another one. And she was a um, mediator between the immigration and government to bring these people over. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, but they had to have sponsors, and so she went around and to get the sponsors for uh, these families as they came. Well, what was the reason for the families wanted to come here in the first place? You have to ask this lady. We're going to find out. We're going to have some several guests later, depending on who drops in and who makes it here today. Right. We're going to meet some of these people. I have to tell you, before we started the show, I talked to a great friend of mine, 
uh, Buzz Rolson, who called me up to talk about a show he had seen on TV with Frank Papps, the old captain of the Juniper, and myself. And uh, he mentioned the Battle of Plattsburgh and mentioned that he saw many years ago in Life magazine a picture of a, a granite stone somewhere on the campus of West Point, which listed the four most significant battles in the history of the United States of America, and it mentioned the Battle of Plattsburgh. And we've been trying to get the Battle of Plattsburgh on the map as being a significant battle for right. years. Mm -hmm. And finally, we're trying to work this area up into a fever pitch, and we're doing that. But I told him where we were coming today, and he got all excited on the other end of the telephone, and he said, Frabatko. I thought he had sneezed. <laughs> no, I said, Frabatko. He said, yes, don't you remember? Frabatko came here as a stonemason, and many of these people were stonemasons who right. came here. And he talked about his son, Tommy, and he talked about how Frobotko came here and they made them, uh, they almost had to prove that they had a great skill or talent before they could come over here. And he said, well, Frobotko built a church somewhere in Europe before he came here. And I guess that was credentials enough because right. these people were fabulous. And then he told me about watching him work with his son, Tommy, one day when Tommy was just a young lad and was building a, a stone wall somewhere and he said he walked on to the job and Mr. the elder Mr. Frobotko said to his son Thomas that's not right I will not have a job that's not right tear it out and do it again and the younger Thomas said okay dad and they tore it out and they did it again. And if that isn't an example of how, what wonderful artisans these people were. Huh? Now I know the, uh, well, M Miner built the school. He brought the Italians because they were the world's best masons to have, make sure that everything was done perfect. So he had uh, a lot of the families come in then. I like the Rawls and the, uh, I'm trying to think, I can't think of all their names, but. But many of the families you have listed in this book, we went down and recognized several names. What is this book you've got there, Marie? Yes, well, the history of the town of Chasey. Okay. Well, we got a new edition that, that's. Oh, you do. History of the town of Chasey, Clinton County, Nell Jane, Barnett Sullivan, and David, Kendall, Martin, familiar names. Right. The, uh. She worked many, many years and did a lot of research and uh, talked to all the families in the area. And she compiled this book and with the help of David. And uh, it was put out in 1970, and we've just put out the third reprint. Have you really? Is it available here? Or it's out? available right here, right now. Well, hopefully we'll get people all excited about this well, subject. I nine last week. Did you really? So if they, when this is done, they're done because I... I can't do it again because it was eight thousand dollars to bring in these books. Oh, it was. And it's uh, oh. so we have. That's just uh, you have to have this money all up front. So I have kind people that back me this time, and they, will, I won't dare ask again. Well, there are many people, even those who don't live in Shazy, who want to know a little bit about the history of the town of Shazy, and they could just come here or contact you to get more information on how to buy this book, right? Right. Yeah. How many do you? How many do you have? We have about 400 here. Well, not now. We have a, a left, got maybe 150 left here because the rest have been sold. No kidding. They're going very well. Do, do they, uh, all the libraries have copies? I hope so. I, I think that some of them are been pretty well worn, which maybe they need to have replacements. I should mention that later on in our show today, not only are we going to in interview some of the people who made that trek from Europe into the brave new world in the late 40s and 1950s, but we are going to have Andrew Spear Jr. himself, who's going to grace our area, who spent his childhood here for many years and moved to, had the bad sense to move away and go to Connecticut, but we, br we bring him back every now and again. His name is really Siva, S-E-V-A, right? Right. Like his, okay. like his dad, okay. Dr. Spear. Yep. And I understand that Andrew found some of the paperwork that we were talking about. I didn't know this. Oh, you mean Calvin oh, kept this secret. Some letters? Letters and things and newspaper articles, and he found those among his mom's 
possessions. As you know, they have a camp here on, on Lake Champlain. I want you to know I have had some wonderful food at that camp. Yes. Josie knew how to make some of that wonderful Polish sausage and... Uh, we used to go out there once in a while and have some mighty good time. She was a nice lady, Mrs. Spear. She was a great lady, and we I lost contact with her for a while, except through Andrew, when she moved to Florida. But uh, we just had a great relationship through the years. She loved to make people happy in oh, any yeah. way she could. She did. Um, as going back to the Battle of Plattsburgh, the little uh, stone library right here was the British headquarters for the uh, battle. And that's not very far from where we're sitting right now. No, about 25 feet. <laughs> we've mentioned that before when we've t taken our whirlwind tours through this area during the celebration of the Battle of Plattsburgh yeah. on our way to Canada and back to get the story from across the border. And uh, that's a story that's still being told. We're trying to get a historical uh, uh, what do you, I can't remember. If you want me to go on a walking tour from Canada, what do you what do you mean? A, not a, a, a marker? No, a historic uh, way from Cham Fort Chambly, Quebec down oh, to um, get a whole trail, huh? And a we're trying to trail? yes, and we're trying to do that, and it's uh, we had a meeting already in Plattsburgh about this. Oh, won't that be marvelous? People can come here from other parts of the country and follow the markers and stop and make the whole trail. Well, I have all my markers done in Jay-Z. They're all, all my historical markers are finished and up to date at this point. Well, you know, before we go any farther in this program, I would love to have, have you tell me when your interest in Jay-Z history started and how you developed a I'm passion I'm for it. Fourth generation Jay-Z. No kidding. And I wanted to uh, come in and I wanted to make sure these papers were all preserved for future generations. And the lady that was doing it was not well, so I offered my services. And I re had retired. And What did you do before you I, retired? I was 35 years at Ares Laboratories in Ross's Point. And my husband was 42 years uh, in U.S. immigration. At oh, Champlain. my goodness. So between the two of us, we work here each day try to get this organized. Do you have others who help you, volunteers? We have volunteers. Or? We have two ladies from Ross's Point, Eleanor Martinson and Joyce Lavoie. Then we have a young lady, uh, her name is uh, Rhonda Trombley O'Hagan, that comes in and offers her time too and helps us out. It's quite a project when you try to preserve history. You have to you have to always be a student yourself, don't you? You have to uh, preserve, and, and there's so many things you have to be careful of, like newspapers cannot be put with other things because newspaper has so much acid it would destroy your paper, oh. uh, destroy your regular paper. So you have to put mylar in on everything, which we have, which we are doing, preserving. And then we're trying to preserve all the documents we have, the uh, Hubble, all the Hubble papers here and from the early 1800s. And we have all them up in the cupboard here, but we have them all in uh, boxes that are archival. You know, it's, it's wonderful. We stopped and saw George and got a copy of the old newspaper article to show what place the Hubble family had in the Battle of Plattsburgh and the War of 1812. And a lot of people who know George and his present business may not know about the Hubble family history here in Shazee. Well, the Julius Hubble started back here as a lawyer in this little stone building here in the early 1800s. And his family originated Champlain, came here. And when he died, they turned, the family turned the papers here. <laughs> they rode down to watch the battle. A lot of people went down as spectators. They even came across the lake that day. Right. But the uh, story I like the best is Mrs. Stetson next door was to have where the uh, British commanders and she told him he was going to lose the Battle of Plattsburgh, and he said, Lady, no one ever talks to a British commander like that, but she said, I'm an American. Isn't that beautiful? But we have documents of that here, too. Isn't that terrific? So now what got you interested in, in this uh, immigration from these people back in the 40s and 50s? I've been in, interested for a long while, but I never could get Mrs. Spear and I could never get together at the right time. And then, she, sadly, she passed away. Isn't that terrific? Well, we're going to continue our program in just a moment. 
Why is it every time you shut off the camera, then you can remember what you wanted to say? I used I to say that know. when I was in the radio business. Turn the microphone off and I can speak a blue streak. Turn it on and I couldn't remember what I wanted to say. That's a penalty so, of uh, forgetfulness. So now you finally remembered what you were trying to talk about. Yes, it's a historical corridor from Fort Chambly to Albany, down along Lake Champlain, Won't down both sides neat. of the lake. That will be so neat. That would be uh, great. Then we'll be recognized uh, for the efforts of the people put in during the Battle of Plattsburgh. Oh. Because a lot of his, uh, children don't know about this, the history. Well, it's about time. Most of the schools and the curriculum in New York State is beginning to teach local history. And I think it's absolutely essential. It's something that I've advocated for many, many years. There are lots of ways to do it. We were talking before about a trip we took on the Juniper with Captain Frank Pabst, and he loves uh, history. And we had a, a huge group of young people in the, what, third or fourth grade, I seem to remember, from the Saranac Central School District. Okay. And as they're looking at the shoreline, and they're looking at the islands, and they're looking at Crab Island and Valcor and Cliffhaven, Captain Frank is describing history to them. I love it. Okay. Learn the history hands-on. Right? Go right. and visit the site. In the fourth grade from now uh, in the state of New York, they have to do family histories. And the, uh, I know they bring the sophomore class over here to Isn't do the uh, town history every year. Oh, that's So marvelous. I love to have the children come. You know, I've had so many of my children, and now my, among my 11 great-grandchildren who call me up on the phone and say, can you and Grandma get together and do the history? We're in fourth grade, and our teacher says yeah, we got to find out where we did it. What a great way to start it! Right. It's uh, well, you have to go back to know where your ancestors come from and the hard work that they all did. They had put in a lot of hours, and a lot of them weren't recognized for the work they did. Well because they didn't make many waves. They no, just worked hard. They just worked hard, and that's one of the reasons we're here today. As a matter of fact, in this wonderful book that Marie has already told us about, Calvin said, turn to page 327. It sounds like we're going to sing a hymn here or something yes. in the old Methodist church, but probably I won't unless you want to. No, no, thank uh, you. But I do remember the first couple of verses to bringing in the sheaves. <laughs> oh, boy. But anyway. Three, page 327 of this wonderful book called The History of Shazy. It says, if I might be so bold as to read it for you, after World War II, many destitute and homeless families in Europe were encouraged to settle in the United States. The majority of them were farmers, and they left their farms both because of the ravages of war and the threat of communism. They were generally referred to as displaced persons, or DPs. We're all familiar, those of us who are uh, older than... <laughs> and many of them lived several years in Germany before coming to the United States. By December 1949, there were 54 such people in Shazy and West Shazy. That's 50 years ago. 50 years ago. The first to arrive was Joseph Badgus. Did I say it right? Did I say that name right? Yes, it's right. Oh, okay, I got to get... Okay, we're going to talk about that. But Joseph Badgus, who came to Shazy on February 12th, 1949, and worked for six months at Heart's Delight Farm, familiar, familiar to everybody in this area, before he was promoted and moved to Chicago. Next came Anthony Martinkus. With the lowness. Well, okay. Well, this, this is this is spelled a different way. M A R T I N K U S. I don't know if that would be the same people or a different no. family, maybe. No. Martinkus or Martinkus yeah. on February 28th of that year, and the first family with children was that of John. Verbyla, maybe V-I-R-B-Y-L-A. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Not yet. No, this is, this is Verbyla, who arrived with his wife Agnes and their daughters Teresa, Leontis, and Irene. 
they r arrived the same day as Anthony Martinkus. Other families to come to Chez-Z under similar circumstances were, and it mentions some very familiar names that we know, all know and love. Many of the families are still represented here. Some of the people who came over ha have since died. That was a long time. As you said, that was 50, 50 years, years ago. ago. 50 years ago this happened. Now, I have to tell you that in 1949, I was only 12 years old. My son's age. Really? Yeah, I brought the son 12 years old. When you came? Yes. Now, let tell everybody who you are. I'm Hona Hobart. I was Ona Duve, D-U-V-E. And I came 49, October 13th, to New York. I came 17th, 49, and Chasey. Met all my four kids and my husband. And what was your husband's name? Gustavus. Gustavus. Guster. The Dekan English. And you had a son who was born in 1937? Yes. See there? Walt, Walter Duvey. Hi, Mom! <laughs> I'm back! <laughs> you can see Walt. He's at PNC. In the really? Place. Yeah, he, he works in PNC for 25 years. No kidding. He already retired. He's a 60, going to be 62 October 14th. I was 62 yesterday. Well, now that you brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> and they treated me well at my house and my job and the whole thing. That's wonderful. Mm. Now, what? tell me a little bit about the story. We're going to talk with uh, my friend Adela in just a few minutes right over here on the side. But how did you decide to come to America? Let's give a little bit about your childhood, where you were born and brought up. And Well, you know, feel like staying in uh, Germany. You don't want to go back to Russians. No place else to go except sign up and go in the United States, which one I'm glad I did it. I really appreciate the people were nice. They helped me out. I have four kids, and thanks to Frank Neverett and Mrs. Neverett, they gave me begin the life. And I'm never going to forget Mr. Minister K, Presbyterian Church. He, all the time, every Sunday, used to come in and make a donation something. They were really nice men. Now, where were you born? Lithuania, in Konas. And what happened? Tell me a little bit about your childhood. What it was life as a little girl in Lithuania? Very poor people, but awful friendly, get together every time and helping each other. And I work in, since I was six years old, I get out from my mom, and I live in alone since then. Think about this now, if you will. You can talk... Marie talked about working hard. What, what time? Age six, you said? Six year old. Isn't that amazing? I used to watch the geese. Did you really? Yeah. They're flying around, and I call them back again and coming to me. And I take care of those. I saw a wonderful newspaper. We interviewed a good friend of ours who retired as a teacher in this area, loves history, found an old newspaper from the 1800s, and I love to look at the old ads in the newspapers. And it said in one of those ads, just one sentence, for sale, geese feathers. Geese feathers, yes, they're making good money too. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I imagine they put them... Uh, Put geese feathers in, uh, what would they put it in? They would put them in pillows and yes. feather ticks? Oh, and and feather blanket. And oh, listen to this. Yeah. Andy's here. How are you, my man? Come on, uh, oh, that's, wait, OG that's, an, whiz. that's yeah. another OG whiz. Another Lithuanian <laughs> phrase from many years ago. OG whiz. Uh, Speaking German, escape me a goat. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to have so much fun here today. We told our audience already that Andy Spear was going to be here, and we are. Just a little bit of background information, and then we're going to continue. Before we get to Andy, uh, I guess we already got to Andy. He's such a shy little boy, you know. I'm my uh, mother's son. And yeah, I know you're your mother's son. Pretty soon we'll have the kazoos out, and we'll be doing March Around the Breakfast Table here. And happy birthday to you from the kitchen band, huh? 
All right, we're talking about Lithuania. You went out and, and watched the geese when you yep. were six. Then what? Well, I keep on growing and funny geese to the pigs, funny pigs to the cows. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's okay. what the young. You got to remember that the geese to the pigs and the pigs to the cows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's okay. the way the Lithuanian kids grow up. They got to support themselves. And you get up early, go watching the cows. You can bring in at noon. You bring in outside at night, and and that's that's the kids' work. It wasn't all sitting in front of the television set and playing with those computer games like Nintendo, huh? Oh, well. A little bit different in those days? I guess so. I guess so. Me having no radio, no electricity, no newspaper, no nothing. If you see a piece of paper, that's going to be in the city, not in country. And I'm country girl. So you really didn't know what was going on in the rest of the world when no. you were growing up no, at all? No, no, no. I just know my brothers and sisters around, um, I mean family around, and that's it. Me talking a lot of them up to, up to Germany, America, talking, but nobody knows about it. You know, I think that's a very important point to make, especially for the uh, aspiring young historians here who think they know what life was like back in the early part of this century. I've had the great pleasure of interviewing many people over the years who lived to be a hundred years of age. And I'll never forget interviewing a good friend of mine who was long since dead, but not before she made it to about a hundred and four. And she was born in Lake Placid. And I said to her, when you were 16 years old, what did you think living in Plattsburgh as a young teenager? What did you think of living in Lake Placid as a young teenager? What did you think of Plattsburgh? She said, I never heard of Plattsburgh until I got married. That's true. That's true. Here we are, less than an hour's drive away today. She never had heard of it and never had visited Plattsburgh until she was an older adult. That's true. I never see Kona till I was a 17-year-old. And that's our capital city. I never see him. Isn't that incredible? And never, of course, got to travel. Oh, travel on foot. Yeah, that's yeah. If you wanted to get there, you threw a sack on your back and took off down the road. 20 kilometer walking if you want to go in the city, on foot. That's a long ways to walk. I guess it is a long ways. Yeah. yeah, and one way transportation, just walking. You walk to church, you walk to work, you walk to any city. It's no ways. Somebody have a horse and a wagon, but very mu not very many because people were poor. Did you get a chance to go to school at all as a young girl? No. Not at all? No. My hand, grandmother was a little bit understand writing and reading. She used to read the Bibles and everything. She teach me letters and numbers. And uh, through the years, I learned by myself, but I never been in school. Now, well, when you came over, first of all, how did you make the connection to come to America in 1949? Very, very poor, very poor, <laughs> very poor. When the man said, you're going to bring the wood, and me thought she going to bring the ducks for us, my son and me, me make the yard for the avid ducks. And I asked Walter, I said, Walter, where are you going to, Ma, are you going to bring the ducks? I said, all right, me going to put them in the garage. In the morning, poor Frank never had come in with the trunk full of wood and for the fire. And me look at him, you are really surprised when it's not the ducks, but the wood. <laughs> 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 you know? But he was very nice man. He used to every other day bring me wood for my wood stove because that's all I have, it's just wood stove. And uh, there were kind of joke, but when a joke, I start crying because I don't understand what they say it. And me preparing dishes for the feeding, and uh, me prepare a little yard for the ducks, and there it is. So you came over on a, on a ship? Yes, yes. What was that like? Pretty well, <laughs> sickness, a lot of sickness. Really? Oh, boy, a lot of sickness. Me were, oh, I think 700. Me came in. Seven hundred? Yes. Seven hundred people we came in. Did you know any of the other people outside of your own family? No. I, I even 
when walking around to look at in the other people. <laughs> because you were too sick, right? Too sick. That's true. That's true. Well, what did, when, when you thought, oh, we're going to go to America, we're going to go to the United States, what did you think about it? What did you know about the United States? Well, we used to watch a lot of movies. Oh, boy. That's how we learn, huh, about the yeah. wild, wild west. Wild, right? wild west, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and yeah. another joke, when I came in, were uh, Halloween night in October. And the kids next door, they came, marked my windows, and uh, screaming and yelling. And I remember my movie in Germany, when they're killing each other and uh, shooting each other. And I said, there it is. That's the wild, wild west me are in. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Well, it wasn't quite the wild, wild no. west up in Chazy then. <laughs> there were a few civilized people here around when you I arrived, in, right? Yeah, I was in West Chazy to... My husband worked for Frank Neverett. He was uh, road, road director or road some road supervisor, supervisor, superintendent. Yeah, Super, okay. yeah, he was a nice man, very nice people, very nice. i really glad to see him, but $15 a week with the six how, people. How much was that? $10 a week. $10 a week, six yeah. people, four kids, four. husband and wife. Yeah. We have to survive. No I bet way. your box of cereal didn't cost three sixty nine back then, did it? Huh? I know what about the cereal. I would have yeah. bought a loaf of bread. The Canadian used to come in and bring me bread second day, 30 loaves. And when nothing else, just the bread, it disappeared. But I'm glad to have in it, too. There were poor days, but if you want to reach something, you can reach it. You can work hard and do it, and you can do it. Isn't that the American dream? Isn't that the American dream? If you want to do something, you can do you it? You can do it. That's the place to do it. If you want to be, look at my daughter. She's in a service. She want to reach the high class. Now she's a colonel. And she want to be major. If you'd be surprised, she's going to reach it. Isn't that amazing? She's already been a major. Oh, pardon me? She's already been a major. Now she's Sorry, a colonel. She's been a major. Now she's a colonel. Yeah. That's, that's that's maybe general next, huh? Well, the general. Maybe then we'll have an announcement if Hillary makes it. Uh, I think I'll run for president of the United States. I'm going to be secretary. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what were the biggest problems you had when you first moved to this area? Was it the language? Was it getting... Lang language, clothing, everything, everything, everything. The yeah. boys go like a Walter going with the woman's shoes in school. You are picked on. It, it, everything were poor. Everything. That's you know that's very very sad when you mention that. He talks about Walter, and I can identify with that mm -hmm. because I was, I didn't come from another country, but we lived in another genre. When I was a young man, my father was a a, a minister, a Methodist minister, actually a Nazarene minister in those days, and his salary was maybe. Fifteen dollars a week or fifteen a month. I don't remember what it was, but we didn't have sh new shoes No, we no. didn't have much to wear. We had mm -hmm. old knickers to wear to school that were probably 10 or 15 years old And he would go to the thrift store to buy our clothes and I wondered why people Laughed at me, but I never really thought about it until you just mentioned yeah, that. Yeah, well Kids come home complaining about what you're gonna do uh, just uh, let it go either way you want it. Eh? But, but one thing, in the United States, if you want to reach something, reach it. Everybody, and younger kids, reach it. You can be something we better be anybody else. Well, isn't that kind of neat? I can hear, we got a cheering section over here, Marie. Yes, well, it's wonderful for her to say that. You know, it is out there. You can yeah. do it if you want to. You know, it's just a matter of getting, you know, the... The it's spunk, the spunk and the gumption, as my mother say, if you got the gumption to do it, I don't even know if that's a real word, but yeah, if you got the spunk or the gumption, you can do it. If you, if yes. you want to get up and work hard and look at your prime example, yes. you're more than 57 years old, I can tell. Mm, a little bit, a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> <laughs> With a son of 62, was he the oldest of your children? Yes, yes. That's terrific. And where do you live now? Plattsburgh Housing Project. <laughs> That's wonderful. And 
Oh, in Long Apartments? Long Apartments. Yeah, right around the corner from where I work in the county government center. Oh, not very far. Not very mm -hmm. far. And no. Now, where are the rest of your children now? Well, once in Eden Chazy, once in Saran Saratoga, one in Virginia, and one in Washington, in Pentagon. Now, have you ever thought what like life would have been like if you had stayed in Europe and not come here? I even don't want to think about it. I even don't it's want not, to think about it. not a pleasant thought. No, huh? no, no. No. I've well, been in Siberia and or, or, uh, you have a little par farm or something, you you rich, you millionaire, you got to go learn how to live poor, to take it to Siberia or take it to Russia and exchange the people. But uh, I don't want to even think about it. Wasn't it terribly sad yes. for you to leave friends and relatives behind? Yes, yes, yes. I can't yes. even imagine what that day must have been like when you got on yeah. the boat. They were, well, when I get in a boat, I was happy. But when me living in Germany from the place to the place, from the place to the place, that was a little sad. Because you cannot get the home, and nobody wants you. You foreigner, you go. Yeah. yeah, that's what the that's what the phrase "displaced person" yes, means. Yes, yes, yes. Became a familiar phrase to us here in this country. DPs, displaced person. Yes, yes, and yes. You know, we see it happening in parts of Europe right now, where people don't can't get to their homes and don't know where their home is. No, 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 no. Unfortunately, we don't seem to learn in some yeah, parts. Yeah, it's sad, isn't it, Marie? Not terrible. Terrible. I feel so. Your heart goes out. You, you don't know what they've been through, but your heart goes out to them. Many times, some of the same issues that we were talking about in the 1930s and 1940s are still being yeah. ground out today. Yeah. And well. So sad. Yes, it is. But you know, it's kind of amazing that our that these United States have accepted people like you. Not only accepted you and allowed you to come here. But you have added so much to the flavor of our areas. What? Um, and these people, what they've added to the town of Shazy, they're the reason we're having this program here today. Right. right. They have added a lot to our, because they have made us understand a lot. What, that's not all living in this country. It's difficult in other countries. Being taken over by greedy people that just want power and money. They don't think about the people they're hurting in these families. We have a lot of people from Kosovo here right now. Yes, a whole nother subject, but related. Right? Same, same thing, same thing's going on. It's all wars and pushing people out of their homes. I think very often, and these are some very good points we're making here today, it's important for us to sit back from our own busy lives and our jobs and move back a little bit and look at the rest of the situation and try to understand what it's like for other people. So try, hard. just have some of our young viewers, especially the younger viewers, and I don't want to put pressure on young people, but I think it's important for young people to understand where they came from. We talked about genealogy, but also to understand what life must have been like what in parts have? of Europe in the late 1930s and through the 1940s and World War II, that infamous that war that, remi that lived in infamy, in the words of the late FDR, and then in the United States to have these displaced persons come here to a place called Shazy in upper New York State near the Canadian border, not only to, be, to fit in, but to be embraced by this area, embraced, and to live and thrive and raise their families and still be around to talk about it 50 years later. Yes. Yes, 50 years, going to be 50 years in October 14th. So I guess I would be safe to say that you're happy you made the move, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Thanks to man upstairs. The man upstairs. Thanks to man upstairs. He kind of runs the show, doesn't he? That's huh? right. Yeah. When you want something, just say the prayer. Yeah. Sometimes we try to take way too much credit for what happens, don't yeah. we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, i tell you what we do. We're going to... Play our little game of musical chairs. Yes, Andy, you're going to get your chance here. <laughs> because 
his mom and dad were so much a part of this whole thing we're talking about today. But I'm gonna, we're going to stop the camera for a minute, change chairs, and move Adela in where you are okay. and get her story as well. And thank you so much for being with us today. I thank you very much for having me. Our program continues in just a moment. Sometimes, in order to get the stories told, I have to use my vast experience in persuasion to get people to sit next to me and talk a little bit. This lady and I have been friends for some time. Adela, yes. you pronounce your last name because I don't do very good at it. Machievsky. Machievsky. Mm -hmm. See, I don't pronounce it half that well. <laughs> I'm not Pretty sure good. that your daughter-in-law pronounces it half that well. <laughs> but we know she's over there and her name is Francine. It's so great to have you up here in Shays E today. This is quite a story we're telling because you people have uh, you're a long ways from where you were born. Kibarte. What's the Kibarte. name? Kibarte. Okay, tell me where that is compared to something else uh, I might have heard of. This uh, on the border, Germany. This, I, where I lived, maybe one kilometer from. Right from the from border. From the Germany. Boy, oh boy. And you were you were born and brought up there. How big a family did you have when you were a little girl? That's I can remember. The first children, the first ward. Before first ward, they were born. They died in 16. Oh, really? Two, two sisters and brother died in 1916. What kind of disease was going after first ward? And I was born in 1920. But you know, that happened a lot then. A lot of people didn't live to very old ages, you know. They weren't all as fortunate oh, as you are to live to... My parents lived. Uh, my mother died 78. Uh, she born the same day, the same month, in June 30. The I be June 30, the same age when my mother died. <laughs> no kidding. Oh, my goodness. How old was your mother when she died? 78 and, 78. and seven, eight months, like this, uh, for November 2nd and die June 30, the seven months. And your dad, how old was he when he died? The same age, 78. Both were 78? Yes, he died in 59. He is born in 1881, January 18, when he died. 59 and Augustine. That's almost the same age that I. Isn't that a. <laughs> this couple months different. That's, that's pretty great when you can talk to people whose parents were built, were born, built. <laughs> were, <laughs> were built and born in the 1880s. That's marvelous. So now we know where you were born. We know you had brothers and sisters. Yes, and one brother was younger. I, Three years and one sister was after my brother eleven months uh, younger. That's I I know we, my sister died uh, sometime medicine game. Our brother was killed in Germany. Oh boy. So uh, I don't know, I just find out after wars. Well, you know, families were torn apart. That's what we're talking about. Displaced persons, families were torn apart. When the least people came to the United States, you know, it was very hard to communicate back home. We couldn't pick up the telephone or send an email on the computer like we can Nobody today. Have and even if you had a telephone here, they wouldn't have one back there. No. And the chances are if they did, the phone lines would be down anyway. Oh, I don't know. The doctors haven't was telephones. That's I know. Doctors had a telephone. That's why I go into the doctors. They have telephones. Now, we know where you were born. Did you spend a lot of your life there? How old were you when you left the town you were born in? In 14, 41. 1941? Okay, you were 21 years old then, right? The stony years. <laughs> and then where did you go? they taken me August, so still uh, I have a few months to go to November 21. <laughs> yeah. And then where did you move to from there? This, I was in Germany. 
working farmer place. And then wh when did you get married? Married <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Not last Tuesday, right? Well, maybe last Tuesday. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember the year you got married? <laughs> yes. You remember what year it was? Oh, 43. 1943. You were in Germany then? In Germany, made it and after war, this uh, making certificate, not uh, in church. After war finished, we taken in church. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> oh, after the war was over, then that you got married in the church. Yes, this time we can go married in church, and we moved. Who is more Catholic? Oh. People was in Germany. Okay, so you're in Germany, and then. What, when did you decide uh, to come to the United States? Thus, uh, our friends was uh, came here to uh, to Jay Z to mine farm of work and was, and they making papers for us and sent for us and we came, oh, and okay. we was living about two three weeks in mine farm, and after find out uh, in Plattsburgh. And the hospital working, my husband working in the laundry. I, I work in a, on the floor in the kitchen. <laughs> Did you really? At the at the hospital? Yes, Champlain Valley Hospital. Yeah, yeah. at Champlain Valley Hospital. That's now the there were two hospitals. We should tell yes, our viewers uh, there were two hospitals back yes, then. There was Champlain the Valley Hospital. Hospital. Part Ruger of the old building still exists over there on Ruger Street as part of the college property, and then there was. Physicians Hospital yes. started by the miners, by the way, in the in yes, the late I, 1920s. I know. Yes, the miner built the. That's I know. Miner built the hospital. And far more recently, the Champlain Valley Hospital closed, and now we have the CVPH, Champlain Valley Physicians Hospital Medical Center. And interestingly enough, this weekend they're ready to open a brand new department uh, called the Alice T. Minor Women's and Children's Facility, and we're going to take some tours and have some fun, and there's a little part of Shazy right down there in Plattsburgh again, right? Right, right. Mr. Well, well Mr. Minor built that hospital, yeah. and he gave it to the yeah. people of the county. Isn't that kind of, kind of neat? The school and give it to the town. Uh, of course. The miners did so much and didn't want to take much credit, but we still know they were around every time we open a book and turn still, around and look at a still, plaque and... They still endow the hospital and the school. Yeah, isn't it incredible? Yeah. All right. Well, you and I were just chatting here. I didn't mean to go over away from you for a minute, but uh, now when you came over here, how many kids did you have when you moved to America? One. One? <laughs> and his name is? Vito. He lives right next door to you yes. in the city of Plattsburgh. Yes, he did live in about... In Eleven years. Twenty years. Marriage. I live in Plattsburgh, Tony. Oh, and that's Francine over here. That's his wife, by the way, and our I, dear I friends. I know. In the start building eighty-eight, he transports April first here. That's I know. And she moved in August ninety-nine. That's eighty-nine. I can't <laughs> date her. I'm terrible on dates. This now. Let me t talk to me about your husband. What did what did he do for a living? What was his job? Masonry, working everything, fireplace building, foundations. What you ask? These people were the best. I don't know how many of these displaced families that moved over here in the late forties up to now. You came in fifty one, right? In nineteen fifty one. I don't know how many of these people were stonemasons. But uh, I mentioned Frobotko a while ago, oh, yes. one of the best, right? Does Frobotko know the job? Yes, from the country. My husband was engineer. No, no job like this working. Does thank you for Mrs. Spear. Yeah, right. let's talk a little <laughs> bit about that. But he was an engineer, right? Yes, engineer they have in the in was after in Germany prison world. You know, the world was came thirty seven. The three weeks was gone in Poland. 
Yeah, it's amazing. Many people did have to change jobs when they came here. Some people were allowed to keep their own jobs. Some had to prove, as we oh. mentioned earlier in the program, that they were pretty good at something before they were accepted into this area. As we said, Fabatko had to show that he built a church <laughs> before he came over here. And yes, they accepted that as credentials. <laughs> So your husband, these people were wonderful stonemasons. I should mention there are a lot of things, a lot of chimneys still exist that were built by these people back in the 1940s and 1950s. The houses may have burned, burned down or f knocked down or f fell down, but the chimneys are still there. But wonderful stonework, right? Yes. Through the years. Mm -hmm. My husband was very well making stones and everything. They were wonderful craftsmen, artisans as we call them. They were just terrific at everything they did. So I want to know uh, what, I'm sure you consider it a good thing that you came to this country. Sure, I like it. I hope so. <laughs> if you don't, we're going to try to see that you like it before you leave here today. It's not. I know it's a little bit nervous for you to sit on the hot seat here and have this television camera going, but I think your story and the stories of other people like you who are displaced families and moved over here is very, very important story to tell. We want young people to know how hard you folks had to work when you were young and how really tough life was work was during the war in Europe. It was awful. The war, uh, I'm not working like she said, six years working. I don't know, this, in Germany, we, they took me 19, almost eight, uh, 20 years, and 41. That's, that's, I called, Russian first came in, that was bad. First, you know, first, and, we the war started, 40, and 40 came, Russian, huh? And 40, June 22, something, came Russian, huh? 1943, when the Russians came, mm -hmm. 1943. I know one year was. Uh, Wars are 41. I came in Germany in 41. Oh, you came in Germany. Come move over here with your chair. We can all chat together here. Let's get your chair over here. I, we can me, all... We can get... Uh, Germany talked in Puran and wagons, like young people in, in Puran after taking oh, yeah. uh, oh, yeah. uh, the... Romani trains, Romani trains, yes. Stroman, and, and no baby taken by the lake, Stroman, and, and uh, oh, yes. trunk, and uh, that's uh, is, uh, Jewish scream. people, people mm. that's half of us. For Jewish people, they're taking baby, they taking park like this and through. That's true. Yes. That's true. I walk in one time on a German, a Jewish. I to, uh, Grave is decked, everybody stand up, little tiny, one little big, big, bigger one, and take the machine gun and cut them up. And the Some of them like they're the taking bay and babies like this, uh, foot, foot, foot uh, through half. And uh, Whoa, half if the woman is pregnant, take a knife, cut them up oh. to look at any baby, how they look like it. That I saw my own eyes. That's not that our eyes. So we uh, no, Jews kill, uh, kill, and kill, and that's. I don't even in there because they hurts too much. That's why was, oh, uh, it uh, was horribly painful for me even to hear the story. Was, uh, maybe, oh, mile over mile, where the Jews was killed. That's uh, I was young. I was like a sea. <laughs> well, those are those are awful memories, aren't they? Oh, yes. Germany. Absolutely for horrible Jews. memories, and you for, mentioned for waking, oh. waking up and hearing machine guns, That's it. and not knowing if you were going to live through that day. Yeah. No, no, nobody knows. Never know no. what were going to happen to your children or uh, your husband. No, no thank you. Just look at it. what's going on. The president sold it, so the country to the Russian overnight, and I early in the morning. So. The, I live in that very far from the Russian, probably. Uh, or thousand miles or so, and uh, they came in, just nowhere, nowhere, no, do no, no, just the machine guns going, the shooting it, the screaming it, the yelling it, and just we found out and one one to the other one talking, and then told them when the Presbyterian people, 
who is Presbyterian, allowed to go to Germany. And my husband is Presbyterian. I'm Catholic. And uh, he signed up right away. He said, I got to get out from here. I can't stand it. And me get out to Germany. See, it, it, you, you can't stand it. <coughs> I can't stand even <laughs> hearing about it. I can't stand hearing about it 50 some odd years later. Would they want to go to Germany? They were saying, you can go. That's you yeah. talk in the later days. I get out earlier because the uh, Presbyterian people allowed to go right away. Me allowed to take the two horses wagon and all the food in the wagon. Oh, and yes, family. I know that. So yeah, was and coming go. like this. Yeah. Uh, I, I, in the board that live in us, I saw. Yeah. Does this remind you of some of the <clears throat> some of the footage you've seen on television over the last three months do you from Kosovo? It? Do you believe it? Yes. I do. Oh, yes. I do. I feel those people feelings. Do you? Good many times sitting by the television and I cry and look at it, all those people walking and my son's feet were that thick from walking. You asking him. We don't have an opportunity. I mean, this is a story that has to be told, that's been told other ways by other people, but these are these are emotions that you people have carried around with you I have a baby since you were very stroller. old. I have a baby in a stroller and Walter walk inside in bare feet on the gravel and everything 500 miles till me reach to some, some, some help. But 500 miles from the home. 500 miles. We hear people complaining from Kosovo that they walk like 20 miles, right, to get where they were going. Incredible stories, and we're going to continue this story in just a moment. You know, I have to apologize for some of our tender-hearted viewers and remind you that uh, some of the folks carrying the cameras and the microphones here are tender-hearted too. Uh, in spite of the fact that we we're here today because we knew this story had to be told. This is a vital part of not only Shazy, but of the United States and the world. These are stories that have been uh, longing to be told for all this time, and we have to release some of this emotion because we still have to heal. And if you don't know that there's healing going on in this room today, this is like an old-fashioned revival service here. <laughs> We're getting right down to the bottom line, as the popular phrase goes today, about what life was all about, what it was like, and how important it, us to, it is for us to appreciate the life we had today. And Andy and I are going to talk a while later on about how we study history because we're, hopefully we learn by what happened before us. Well, sometimes we don't learn too well, and that's a story that deserves to be told today. Adela, you were telling me that your husband was in a concentration camp? Yes. He was in, working by farmers, descendant, two farmers working. And where were you at that time? Yes, I met him. <laughs> oh, you were there too? <laughs> yes, I met him. So it was, a good, it was a good thing for you to get out of there when you did, right? I don't know. I just... They gave and eat, and uh, they no was paying. No, we no get no penny. Oh no, you didn't. You didn't get a salary and retirement insurance benefits and no. things like that, did you? Huh? No. I left. Where you go into the doctors, was everything free. Yeah. No, or sick or something. If you could yeah. find a doctor or get to one, yeah, right? Yes, what you get. That's uh, everything. They no charging was. They no charging the Germany. For Germany people, you know, to five hundred dollars what you make it in month. Over five hundred, you need pay everything. It's amazing. <laughs> oh yes. I gotta tell you I, that. By the border, was living in Germany. Germany, I know very well, and I can speak Germany. You can speak German, you can speak Polish, Lithuanian, Lithuanian, and English very, very well. She worries about not being understood. We understood 
almost more than we wanted to understand today because these stories are so absolutely sad. But you know what? We are so delighted you came to this country. We're so delighted like that be, you yes. live in the North Country, and it's very important for us to have met you. This is a lady who loves to walk, spends a lot of time walking over at the mall and up and down the street and tending that lovely little garden. What have you got planted behind your house this year? What have you got in your garden? You got anything growing? Oh, yes, my beans. It's so tall. <laughs> yeah, your beans. Lettuce, I picking up. And you got dill, some oh, dill, some peas. I put on all this. Still not coming peas. Still not coming the peas, huh? No. Come on now. Tomatoes, cucumbers is out. Mm. All the peas I cannot get for first uh, this last week I put on my peas. Yeah. Radishes. Yeah. Yeah, Francine say radishes. Radishes is, is out, yes. <laughs> I always put on radishes and put on peas or something. And that's uh, your radish is pulling up on peace can grow in you know, all beans. <laughs> and she crochets. I have seen some of her handiwork. Crochet, knitting was before. You mm. know why knitting sweaters and everything. That's um, um, kinds of good stuff, huh? Yeah. Well, you know what? I am so happy you came here today. It took me a little persuading <laughs> to get you to do it. Francine was willing, and I was willing, but she says, I don't know if she's... You better talk to her, Gordy. So I called her up, and I said, will you do it? It's a good story. And she said, okay. <laughs> so you're here today. Thank you so much for coming here. I hope you live a long and happy life, and I know how sad life was for you many, many years ago, but it's... It's good now. You have friends and family around you. Good neighbors, I have. Good neighbors for all those years. And uh, a lot of help I get from Mrs. Uh, Spear. Yeah, we're going we're uh, to talk an awful lot about that help uh, from Mrs. Spear and uh, yeah, Dr. Spear way back when. Yes. Of course, if it hadn't been for them, this story wouldn't be told today, would it, huh? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where you might be. As I said before, where we... Yeah. But this, anyway. The Spears was very good. Good for us, good friends. I bet you maybe went to visit that camp once in a while, too, huh? Out there on Lake Champlain. We went to that camp. Oh, boy, what people they were. I didn't get to meet this family until the 1960s. You had already been here for maybe 10 years before I even moved to Plattsburgh. But I'll tell you, I've had some pretty good mm. kielbasa at that camp. I got the recipe. I can you, oh, you got it, baby? <laughs> You're on, boy. Yes. That, was, that was the but single easy. best food I ever ate Johnson in my life. Was, uh, Polish people. You know Johnson Farmer, Fajesi? I knew some of the people. Yeah. yeah. That's great. I know was uh, too. I met them here. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to... Uh, in one franchise, I don't know the last name, she was Mary. She was coming off into my place. I don't know the last name. I can't remember the names of a lot of the friends I've had down through the years, but we slap each other on the back and make a funny sound when we say hi. Um, mm, uh, they say, Fred, you remember me, Fred. Oh, okay, Fred. So anyway, thanks for being here today. We hope we didn't tire you out too much. No. <laughs> Look, Francine, thanks so much for bringing her. She is a dear, dear lady. And I'll, and I'll get to see you again lots of times, okay? Oh, yes, the bishop. And I'm going to move the microphones over to, to talk to Andy Spear. And we're going to look at some of the old letters and some of the old things that we have that connect the past with the present. And 1949 and 1999 are going to come together with a great crash right after this. I'm just thinking our viewers must think we're magic because every time the camera starts up again, everybody's sitting in a different chair and there's no music, so it's not musical chairs. Um, <laughs> We're laughing now and smiling, but it hasn't always been the case since this program began. And I say again and again, it's a story that needs to be told, and there's a great deal of emotion involved in stories like this. People being displaced 
from their homelands, leaving their family and friends behind, recalling these horrible memories of a horrible time in the 1930s and 1940s. There is no way to describe it in any other way. War is always a horror, uh, but it persists. And I got next to me my good friend for so many years, Andy Spear. Hello, Gordy. How you doing? Great to have you back in town. We talked about you a lot before you got here, and we said what a terrible mistake it was for you to move to Connecticut. But well, you, you insisted, so it's a great it's a great pleasure when you come back to see us. Well, I try to get back as often as I can now. So now that I'm retired, I have more time. I know you do. Is how is the camp? Do you still own the camp? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I inherited it from my parents, and uh, fixed it up a little bit. You're gonna have to come down for some of that Lithuanian oh. sauerkraut and kielbasa. Oh, my mother's oh, recipe. Oh, oh. <laughs> Salivate makes me like Pavlov's dog here. You know, ring the bell, talk about kielbasa. You got me any way you want me to talk about kielbasa. That's the best I ever had when your mom, when your dear mother was still alive. Good well, times at that camp. Well, we've always had good times there, Gordy. I remember when you were working up at the radio station, my mother and I'd jump in the car, and she'd say, here, you hold this, and I'd get this hot bucket of sauerkraut and kielbasa, and we'd take it up there and leave it with you at the radio station. I'd try to read the news and take a bite of that sauerkraut and kielbasa and then try to finish the news. Also that, that was pretty, that was the problem all those years. It was the kielbasa, that's what did it. I've got the recipe. I'm going to make another pot this summer, and you'll have to come out to the camp and uh, try it, okay? That's wonderful. That's the deal. Andy, what, what, tell me about some of your early childhood memories uh, your wonderful parents. You mean at uh, Shazy Central Rural School yeah, before that too. they tore it down? And that, that too. <laughs> they tore down every school I ever went to from my <laughs> earliest childhood. Well, that's another story, but... Uh, I want to get in that tunnel under the road mm. sometime. But I remember my uh, my uh, mother, uh, my father, of course, was doing his doctoring, but uh, she was mostly involved in uh, helping people from Lithuania, uh, Germany, Poland, and uh, Latvia to come to the United States. Uh, because my mother was born and raised Lithuanian, she spoke it fluently, and I learned a little bit. My father was Lithuanian, he also spoke it fluently. So she seemed to be a natural, and she was an activist and, and involved in a lot of things. Um, to help out with the Catholic Charities and the U.S. government to bring people from um, war-torn, ravaged, uh, you know, Europe uh, over here. Um, and when I heard that you were doing this uh, uh, program, and I was asked by Calvin Castine, my friend, if I, you know, could help out, well, I went into our basement uh, in Plattsburgh, and I found old and mildewed and dusty letters and correspondence from the State Department, from the Catholic Charities, letters from Lithuanians themselves in Lithuanian and I really I well I don't I don't read the the written word I speak a few I can say Kaiptau Ashbuskirai and uh, <laughs> things like that but Ashmoka Shnekeklatovishkai Pedbiski Pedbiski I have no idea what the man is saying oh, this, well. this could be an off color joke and I wouldn't have a clue <laughs> oh, is that what it was? Huh? Oh. But anyway, she uh, she seemed to be a natural, and uh, she helped uh, with uh, bringing the folks over. She did the correspondence between the Americans who were looking for families to help out, and uh, of course she could write back to um, you know these uh, uh, departments and and uh, so forth over in Europe, uh, in in Lithuania, and she did speak some Polish as well, so that was helpful. And uh, I, so I went down to the basement uh, and uh, found this big box full of correspondence and papers. And I spent about six or seven hours one night reading it, uh, tears rolling down my cheeks, the sad letters from people who were just so grateful to be allowed an opportunity to get here to this country. And um, the, some of it, uh, a person would say, um, we need a farmhand or we need a, a brick mason. And many times the people over there were, were professors in college and teachers engineers, and educators, engineers. engineers and uh, they needed a, uh, they'd had to have a job in order to get over here. So they said, sure, I, I, can, I can lay bricks and so forth. They might have been pretty good at it because the Germans had them doing it all during World War II. That is if they didn't execute them. The, the ones they didn't want, they executed. And the, 
and the ones that had any sort of a trade, they, they used them for uh, their, the Germans' war effort. But uh, it, like I said to you during one of the breaks, uh, I'm a historian you know, by my college education. I'm also a historian by nature. And I've always felt that we could you know, learn from the past by studying the past and perhaps not commit the mistakes of the past again in the future. But um, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be true. And it really breaks my heart uh, knowing what went on during World War II. I love to watch the History Channel, for example, and see the same thing being duplicated again over in Europe. And I guess what I want to say uh, is that I, I just hope that the Americans open up their hearts and, and so forth as they have in the past to let these people come over to the country. And we found out that uh, many, many of these people, even though sometimes we Americans felt they were taking away our jobs, have gone on and their families have, have gone on to become major, major contributors to our society and have helped America to grow and become, you know, the kind of country that it is. So, I mean, that's just, I, I'm running off at the mouth. Well, Excuse you know, me, Gordy. These, these families that moved here to the Shazy, West Shazy area and this whole general area at that time have added so much to the richness mm -hmm. of, our, of our culture. United States America is a, is a wonderful cultural mix, as you know. It's what we are today. Just think of the, all the countries and the cultures and the ethnic backgrounds that are represented in America today, and that's part of the great charm. But to take a little area like this and bring all these special talents and these special people, if our viewers don't have that flavor based on the interviews today, then they're never going to get it, folks. It's just amazing. As you were talking, I'm thinking of, of Plattsburgh Air Force Base, um, that military installation for so many years there, way before the Air Force was here, the Navy was here, the infantry was here, other installations through the years, bringing people into this area from outside. And even during the 1960s and 70s and early 80s, when Plattsburgh Air Force Base was in its prime, think of the wonderful cultural mix that it brought here. It added to to uh, athletics in our area schools. It added to uh, culture, people who had you know, musical ability, people with many, many talents brought into this area. And part of what we are today is because that military installation brought. But down through the years, we found out via this program today that we were bringing people here from other countries long before Plattsburgh Air Force Base was built in the 50s. Right, Andy? Well, yeah, that's, <laughs> I'm not going to argue with you on that. That's very true, sure. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. But these families that, and, and the, you say you're a historian, man, you are a part of the history yourself with that wonderful mother of yours who, as we know, right up to the day she died, was so interested in making other people happy. If she could walk in a room and make you smile by singing a song or doing a little dance. The kitchen band, you remember or, that? Yeah, the great kitchen band. That's what pleased her more than anything. Somebody once said about my mother, um, Josie gets involved in everything. And they said, I swear to God that uh, when she's uh, being lowered into the ground, we're going to hear a rap on the inside say, wait, there's one more thing I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe she did. Maybe it's a good thing you weren't there. Oh, boy, I don't know. She um, did a lot of things in her yeah. life and touched a lot of lives, including my own life and our long, long-term friendship. But this is a chapter that occurred, as I said, 10 or 12 years before I even arrived. What was it like for you as a, as a young, now you were a teenager when she started all of this? Well, I have some good memories about that. Um, there's some of them a little bit humorous. We had a man that uh, actually lived with us. I mean, we didn't, we put our money where our mouth was, is, whatever. And his name was Joseph Gozdek. Joseph Gozdek, he was a Polish fellow. And... Um, he moved in with us, and he did odd jobs around, uh, you know, did yard work and, and stuff like that. And uh, he got paid by the family, and every Saturday night he'd go down and he'd uh, have a couple of beers at the Chanticleer and Shazy and so forth. <laughs> well, he came back, and uh, my mom and dad had this uh, little old lady. She never got married. Her name was Jenny, Jenny Menor. The Menor family is up, uh, lives up in Altona, or did. And uh, Joe would come home with a few beers, and he try to grab Jenny and give her a big kiss. He says, I love you, I love you. And Jenny was like, get away, get away, you dirty old man. <laughs> 
So <laughs> Joe was uh, Joe was a lot of fun. He moved to Chicago, and unfortunately, I heard that uh, he had uh, somehow or other died from food poisoning. Uh, you know, maybe something he ate and what have you. So, um, but I remember Joe. I also remember another family. Well, of course, I, I, I knew the Calvituses, the Farbotkos, the Skinkies, uh, Matalonis. Uh, um, I remember Ponya Matalonis, he was a, a professor from a college, and he worked at the hospital. His wife, Ona Matalonis, she also worked at the hospital. Drew a lot of my blood, uh, you know, oh, when really? I was donating. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, yes. She was working in the kitchen about 10 years soon after. Yeah, yeah. Kitchen, huh? Yeah. So you, she knew she knew Mrs. Matulonis also. So I knew a lot of the I knew a lot of the families that were up here. But one that comes to mind is I was about 13 years old, 12 or 13, and there was a family and they had three lovely lovely daughters. It was the Dobrovolsky family. That was their name, Dobrovolsky. And they lived on a farm down on the Shazy Landing Road. And my parents would well, occasionally have the Dobrovolskys over to the camp for a little cookout on Sunday afternoon. Well, the oldest girl, she was about 12, and I fell madly in love with her. She was beautiful yeah, and blonde. Now we're, now we're getting right down to it here. Lithuanian. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, the three lovely blonde daughters, uh, their parents uh, eventually moved on. They, they moved out west somewhere, so I lost track of them. But even uh, one of those lovely Lithuanian girls came over and made my heart flutter. <laughs> Don't you love it? Don't you love it? I knew we'd get down to the basics of this story. Look who's giggling over here. <laughs> you're going to edit that out, right? <laughs> We're going to edit that out. All right. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, yeah. See it. <laughs> now, we have, you said somewhere in your archives you have a list of names, but oh. I've got a list of names in yep. this book. Yeah. Look down this list of names on this page or the next and read some of these family names. You've mentioned already mm -hmm. a few. Uh, there's no first name. It's Valaitis. Uh, Payadas, Sa Savishai, uh, uh, Vincus, Trehokas. Oh, am I glad I didn't have to do this? Selakis. Okay. Uh, who moved to Chicago, came to the Dragoon Farm. So the, this is where they came to also. But and I say you mentioned for Botko. Uh, I, we didn't get that. Okay. Many thanks are due to the families of Otto Calvitus. Uh, I know Warner and Aini, both of them uh, I know personally. Albert Farbotko, Mrs. Uh, Parker Hurlbut, right Stefan yep. Glank, right Mrs. Parker Hurlbut. That's right. Yeah. Married into the Hurlbut family, huh? That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stefan Glank. Some of these names I just don't know, but yeah. Gustave Duve. That's right. Ah, yeah. before that. Uh, his wife, Ona. That's right. Mat Matua. Uh, my Lithuanian's not that good. Marokas, Otto Calvitus, Otto, Otto Calvitus, um, August Calvite, Richard Calvitus, and from Poland, Joseph Musial, Musil, Stefan Glank, Glantz, <laughs> Maliniak, <laughs> Maliniak, yeah, okay, uh, uh, Maszajewski. There she is. Machieski. Right okay. Um, and Albert Farbotko, his wife, Alexandra. Then it goes on to say all of the children and so on and so forth here. The only ones who remain Shazy now are the two Calvitus brothers, Otto and August. Um, well, I guess uh, Warner is down towards Plattsburgh. Yeah. Um, and uh, Aini is, is up by West Shazy. In fact, uh, uh, a friend of mine just left his uh, puppy dog out there, boarded it for a couple oh, of really? weeks. Yeah, yeah. Aini has a, and his wife, they, they have a, uh, um, yeah. a boarding place for, for pets. People oh, go away. Gosh. So this, yeah. this yeah, is a wonderful book. I, I if you, read this if you want a copy of this book, we know how to get it, don't we, Marie? Just come right down here to the town of Shazy offices and get a copy. What other things did you bring, bring us that might be delicious additions to well, our program today? Uh, I don't know if you can get a close-up of this, but yes, we can. I think that you my take, mother. There's you take a microphone and talk, and I'll hold uh, the picture. Tell okay. Me, tell me what it's all about. Well, it's uh, four folks. One I know. There's my mother. There's a priest in it. I think one of the fellows is uh, one of the displaced uh, persons, and the other is probably the farmer who owns the farm. But um, other than my mother, I don't know who the other three individuals are. 
But oh, isn't it? Isn't it beautiful, though? What? Maybe someone else could wonderful, them. wonderful pictures, <laughs> and the hairdos are just delicious. And I think that's the, a farm myself, or, or maybe a West Shazy Probably farm. true. The Holstein What's cows the, in the background. Who's the father? Who, father, the pre- Thompson. father Thompson. Oh, father Thompson. Father Thompson. Father Thompson. There's my mother here, and I, I'm not sure who the other two people are. I'm not sure if I would have recogn- even recognized your mother in that picture. We're passing pictures all around here. Looks like a Mr. Miner. No. Oh, oh yeah. Mr. You hold the microphone again, and I'll hold this picture because <laughs> this is great. No, Mr. Miner died way before that. You want to see the three-tined hay fork, boy? That's still in existence today. Mm. It's a hay wagon right behind him, I bet. Yeah. Hager Studios, 46 Margaret Street in Plattsburgh, New York. That was the old hay wagon. Look at that. You just kind of mm. threw it on with a hay fork, folks. That was the day before loaders loaded the hay. That uh, must be a West Shazy then. Um, oh, great. Amongst all the stuff that I picked up from my uh, mom's collection of correspondence, uh, there were Lithuanian newspapers. This is completely in Lithuanian. Uh, there were letters in Lithuanian from... Uh, uh, just from individuals that have been placed. Hold it up and let sure. Calvin take a picture of it. Shoot it, Calvin. It sure does smell musty. Too bad we don't have smell of vision here. <laughs> I'll hold, try to. Hold. I got it. Oh, what great! All folded up in boxes in the basement. Did you know this stuff was there? He, mm, sort of. I, I saw it there, and then when someone wanted it, uh, I went down and salvaged it. Uh, here's an article in 1950, uh, New York uh, Herald Tribune about the Baltic underground and what they were doing to undermine the Russians, the Lithuanians, Latvia, and Estonia. Uh, Now that Russia has uh, given up on communism, Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia now have their independence back and their own governments and so forth. So I think uh, that makes the Lithuanians in the group here today very happy. Isn't that amazing? Oh, sure, if she can read that newspaper. All right, what else have you got? Oh, man, look at, he's got the... He's yeah. got he's got a ton and a half of material here. Gold mine. Oh wait a minute, mm-hmm. some creatures got after some of that stuff. Looks like it got a little damp, like the stuff in my basement there one time or another. Well, I'm telling you, there's all kinds of stuff in here. Isn't this neat? Oh, Treasures. Wow. Treasure. Marie's going on. I said, Oh yeah, look at this stuff. Wow. Gold. 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 It's gold. Here's an article on the death of uh, Father Capron, 39 of Trout River. And uh, it goes on to tell about him, and he was involved in helping displaced persons be relocated in the United States. So this just uh, he started out as an army chaplain. Yeah, yeah, that's right, <laughs> Reverend Capron. There's, sure did. there's everything there. Uh, you you can spend you can spend the next couple of days, uh, Gordy, just going through it. This is in Lithuanian, also. Uh, also in Lithuanian, these are articles that my mother, she subscribed to the uh, Lithuanian newspaper out of uh, Chicago. Yeah, mm-hmm. let, let's do uh, yeah. Oh, that's there. the North Country Catholic. Yeah, now Calvin would like this. That's this is the North Country, 1949. With. There's an old issue. Oh, official newspaper. That's funeral services for uh, Father William Capron. Take an idea. Take a look at that one, boy. That's more than a couple of years ago, I'll tell mm-hmm. you that. huh? Yeah, that's an old, old one there. Oh, uh, yeah, there's the address on it, Andrew Spear. How about that, huh? Americanism, uh, classes for DPs begin tonight. A series of Wednesday night sessions to be conducted at PHS. One of the first things that uh, uh, was that uh, the displaced persons came over and had, um, we conducted classes, I guess, down in, 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 in Plattsburgh at the high school on Americanism. You know, so they learn more about our, our country, democracy, and so forth. And, you know, this program, it says, will not be solely for DPs. It'll be open to other new arrivals in the Clinton County area, as well as others who may want to participate. Mrs. Andrew Spear of Shazee, who has been actively interested in the uplift of displaced persons for the past two years, has continued her interest to the educational phase of their rehabilitation, and it was at her request the program is being inaugurated. And the Salvation Army was involved. The Plattsburgh Kiwanis Club was involved. And uh, that's very interesting. I don't know what year it was, 
But we know it was January 18th, so it was winter time. Uh, no, can't tell exactly what year it was, but we can Probably we can guess in, it was in around 1949, 1950. 50. United Lithuanian Relief Fund of America. That's in December 21st, 1949. 49. Partial letter. Yep. Oh boy. United Lithuanian Relief Fund. As, or at least we have all the names of all the committee members listed on the side. There isn't very much left of that. You have a lot of correspondence there, don't you, Andy? We don't have time to read it all this afternoon, but there's all kinds of information here. Um, the Federal Textbook on Citizenship. Wow, we. A liter literary literacy reader, the Day Family Book Two. This was United States Government Printing Office printed in 1943 and reprinted up through 1948. It's kind of a kind of an amazing book all itself. Maybe we could all learn something in that one. Okay, now what have you got? Oh Lithuania, my! Lithuania, the country and the nation. I 1946. Think. Take a look at this. Some Owen would like to see that too. I'm sure. I will show it to her in yeah. just a moment after we get this a picture of it. This right here. Oh, that's interesting. Take a look at that. Oh, we have, we're like little kids in the toy box here today. We have um, special delivery from Yonkers. Um, <laughs> little notes that your mother wrote on an envelope. This might have been in it for all I know. Uh, could be. From Father Dwyer. Come on. Ooh. I wonder if that could be our father Dwyer, Monsignor Dwyer. I wonder. Could be. Ninth, this was April 29th, 1950. Massachusetts, you can see on the letterhead there. Oh, the displaced Lithuanian couple are no longer displaced, it says. That's right. The marriage, the marriage was, was solemnized this morning at 7 o'clock. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, are these. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was interesting here. Uh, the letter that you just uh, noted uh, in some of the earlier discussions, um, I think, and I, I'm probably right, in Europe uh, during World War II, when the Germans and other types of oppressive regimes like the communists, the first thing they did when they took over a country or were running the country is they tried to stamp out all forms of religion, Catholicism being one of them. And the only marriage that was recognized was a marriage by the state. So you had to go to the courthouse, get married by the state, and they forbid religious marriages. And uh, I think that uh, one of our interviewees earlier said that, oh, finally they were able to get married in the church after the war was over with. And I remember I, I, I married in, in, uh, in Europe myself when I was over there with the military services. I married a girl from Austria. And they still required the, the state marriage. You had to get married uh, in the state courthouse. And then you could go and get married by the church. So we had two weddings in one day. And uh, one by the state, one by the uh, church. And we had the wedding in two different languages. Once in, one in English and one in German. So I was married four times in one day, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Yeah. So. What other, do you remember anything significant from this group of, of things? Uh, you said... All kinds of emotions came to the front. Uh, I just grabbed one page here. And it says, The Nazis deported many Lithuanians for slave labor. Seizing young uh, people probably in churches on Sundays. Mm -hmm. Think about this. Remembering the unspeakable brutalities. First Soviet occupation. Many thousands fled to Germany when the Russians came back the second time. Thus, there mushroomed a group of 100,000 displaced. displaced Lithuanians in Germany and Austria, which were liberated by the uh, advancing American armies. Under the congressional program, some 30,000 came to the United States. The rest are going to Canada, Australia, South America, Argentina. Argentina. Listen to this. During the Middle Ages, Lithuania was a powerful state, extent, extending from the Baltic to the Black Sea. Helped to keep the Tartars out of Western Europe. The Tartars got only Russia. Held off the Germanic Drangnok. A 
against the Slavs. And it goes on and on. Boy, I'll tell you, there's a little bit of the history right here. That's page two. I wish we had page one. You're nodding your head over there. You know some of that, don't you? I know that. I know that. Me talking, my grandmother used to keep in track and all that and telling us all the time those stories, all that what's happening. That sounds familiar so much. Feels like my grandmother reading the book. I don't have quite probably don't have the same voice as your grandmother, but the information brings back all those memories. It's kind of incredible how we, that we, what, the things we have here today. I want you to see how envelopes used to be addressed back in those days. This is uh, before the days of zip codes, Andrew. <laughs> And there was only three cent stamp on it too. I might add. Yeah, three cent stamp. But you can see how the address Jay was. Spear. Just Jay's, yeah, Jay, Jay Spear. Good. There was never, never mind. There might have been a Jack or a Josie or a Fred or a George and Jay's in New York. You know, isn't that amazing? And they always knew where where it came from. I can't. Oh, that's Plattsburgh. P L A T T S B U R G. No H. New York. Um, can't read that last name, but it's RD2 and Kara Bubbins. Kara oh. Bubbins. Ah, don't that was probably that. the family that they were. That yeah, this is uh, also Lithuanian here. I think many of these letters uh, corresponding with my mother were um, probably expressions of gratitude. Um, and only someone who reads the Lithuanian language, which I don't, um, would be able to verify that. I could see $35 in there, and that's the only thing I could see. What else have you got over here? Oh. Any other little gems that come to mind? Look at the well, packages. Well, you know, you saw $35. There. I think some of the people that had uh, were caring for families that uh, they. I think I think the uh, I think the uh, uh, the uh, the charities organizations you know gave them a stipend every month to uh, help out with the expenses of maintaining the family. A little bit too personal to read, huh? Yeah. Well, she borrowed money and gave it back money. That's. Oh, isn't that amazing? Knowing Josie, knowing Josie, that would be absolutely true. These were long before the days of computers, you know, when when your things were typed on old typewriters. That brings back great memories of me. Way back, this comes from St. George's Rectory in Burke, New York, April 5th in 1950. Dear Joe. Dear Joe, <laughs> thanks for your letter and best wishes. Hope you all have a happy Easter. I am returning the check for Pupelis. That account was paid by Sister Annunciata in January. Thanks for the other. I received a check from Gediminal Galvanauskas for 34.50. His account was 36.56. It was sent from Chicago. Isn't that great? This is from Burke, New York, St. George's Rectory. I have visited the Valikas family in Canton, and I advise they're going to Boston as the sponsor is not all that satisfied with the farm work of Mr. Valikas. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? He says that he is a bricklayer and I suppose he can get work in Boston. The girls are quite old and should be able to get work in Boston. It is too bad they didn't go to Boston first. I know they won't work out at Canton and I don't think the situation would be improved on another farm. The address of Gubiris is Dixon, Dickinson Center, New York, oh, care of Donald Richards. And in close, please find a check for $29. Sincerely, Father Devon. Isn't that great? So well, all this correspondence. Language barrier there too, and I think that caused a lot of the problems. They they lost their patience with these pe the people, you know, which is sad. Well, you know, we um, I hate. Well, there's expectations on both sides. Uh, the families had certain expectations, and the people that bring in had certain expectations, and they didn't always work out. No. In most cases, they did, but where there were bumps in the road or rough spots. Uh, Perhaps it was better that they, they found a different location. But I think that's sort of normal. Oh, yeah. I think most of the people where I let, read letters that were in English were just expressing their gratitude for being able to be over here rather than over in war-torn Europe where conditions were much worse. They were in uh, DP camps. Uh, there was probably a lack of water. And, you know, this is what I read. I, and we have some folks here today that experience that. So I, I, I don't want to take you know, their, their place in expressing that, so. Anyway. Um, wonderful stories. I don't know I a, what else might be in here. I got a file full of it, I got a file full of it. I'll tell you what, we're, we're going to, um, we're gonna do another chapter of this program. We will get some more of the families together. We'll get to talk with some of the 
younger people who are around, some of the people, some of the very young people around age 62, like Walter, uh, about my age, you might remember what it was like and to walk at age 12, 500 miles with no shoes on. Uh, you know, I'll never complain about going to, the only reason I'd go to school with no shoes on is because I couldn't find them both when I took off in the morning. Because <laughs> most of the time I lived right around the corner from the school. So anybody tells you Gordy Little walk four miles in the ice and snow to go to school as a little kid is it, wrong. All the time my mother would be saying it's, how come you're only, you're always late, you live 500 feet from the school. How come those kids who do have to walk four miles to school and get there before you do? How come these ladies look so young and all they've been through and they're their ages? Now, I think that's a compliment, don't you? I think, I think they I look... I can't get over the ages. They I tell me they are and, the, and how young they both look. They're absolutely amazing. Sometimes it's that... It's sometimes <laughs> it's that... And they have smiles. Oh, of course. The they're charming. Well, there are a lot of other families represented. Today, they're speaking for all the other families who came in 1949, 1950, 1951. I'm so glad that they came. Uh, I'm so glad, that Andrew, that you came back to see us today. Wow, I'm going to have to take a deep breath. It may take me weeks just to process all of this information because I think very, very deeply about these things. You know how I cared about your mother. I mean, that goes without saying, and I hope that feeling was mutual. We loved each other. Uh, you and I have been friends for many, many years here, here in the North Country, and it's a, it's a tragedy that we can't, can't see Calvin Castine, who's behind the camera, reacting to these stories here today, because uh, we hear these stories and we think we're really tough, having been reporters and having done television shows, and we think we're steeled guess what? Those emotions, even though they date back all those years, are just about that far from the surface. For these people, and by osmosis for us, it's incredible. I think we've, we've uh, accomplished something very, very important here today. Dad said he walked a mile to school. It was nothing, was it? Isn't it amazing? You think about what do you think about this whole thing here today? What's your reaction? Did you have any idea that we th these things were going to be unlocked? Wait no. till I get the microphone over there to you, Marie. No, I, I, it's tragic. It just uh, the emotions just uh, touched your heart. Uh, it's just something that I can't explain. But as a historian, you're very the much involved in the history of Shazy. The French went through this back in the 1700s, and it's got this ever going. And the Chinese went through it, the Japanese, the Koreans, uh, Europe, and right back in Kosovo today. It just never ends because of greedy people and power, hungry people. It goes always back to the same thing. History repeats itself, right? I think we're learning that today at this session. Yeah. But it's been a, it's been a. It's been a, a learning experience. It's been a learning experience. It's a catharsis. It's a way to get things out, to cleanse your soul. Every once in a while, you have to, you have to review, even though it's painful. You have to review, and somehow by reviewing, you can diminish the, the pain. I know, oh, no. oh, oh, since she's been here, but I never knew, because she's never, I've never heard it before. But I've known her all my, all her life since she's been here. Isn't that amazing? Well, in wrapping up this program, I want to say thank you, Ona, for being here today. I thank you for having me. I really enjoy it listening. You're a wonderful lady. We'll make sure you get copies of this. I want to thank you, Adela, for being with us today. Thank you, too. Francine, thanks for driving the car. <laughs> thanks. You're welcome. Thanks for living, living next door to this marvelous lady and my good friend. Marie, Marie, thanks so much for allowing us to come into your little shop, the best one in New York any, State. Any, anytime, anytime. If you want to do another program, you're welcome here. Well, we're very, Calvin and I are always, I think we must be related to, to Harvey. We like to tell the rest of the story. Page two. And maybe we'll get to I do this again. <laughs>
And of course he'll come up again. Up here all the time. He may I'm live in Connecticut, but we got this very tight wire that goes all the way down. We just There's tug on it. And maybe yeah, we we'll get them all. We'll, yeah, it's up to you to plan it. Oh, no. this the rest of us are just going to show up. <laughs> Calvin will bring a fresh tape and batteries and find out where the plug is, and we'll do it again. Andy, thanks for coming over. You're welcome, Gordy. Good to see all these hey, people here, too. for having such a delightful mommy. <laughs> I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> oh, gosh. I'm just my mother's son, that's all. I love it. And you certainly you are. Like yeah, I, know. I look like my father. <laughs> Every I laugh about that all the time. I wrote a column about it, about looking in the mirror each morning and finding every year that I get older, I look more like my father. I have his same mannerisms. I cough and spit out the window of the car and do all the things that my father... Did. <laughs> <That was disgusting>. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? That pleases to me to be like my father, and that's, and that's great. So here we are today, folks. You can draw your own conclusions. I hope we've done something important here today. I hope you feel as though we did, because I do, and I know Calvin does. And who knows where we're going to be next time or what we're going to do 